Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today uh, as we will be discussing training your advocates to work with incarcerated survivors and introducing a new facilitator's guide and slide presentation you can use to train advocates at your agency about uh, the specifics of working with incarcerated survivors. Before we get started, I'll just say out loud, please, at any point, if you have questions today, we want to know what they are, uh, go ahead and type them into the chat box. This webinar today is co-presented by the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Just Attention International as part of the California Advancing PREA project. Although this training was developed specifically for California rape crisis centers who serve California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation prisons, much of the information we're gonna to share today is relevant to agencies nationwide who are looking for guidance and training their volunteers and advocates to work with survivors who are in detention. And today we'll be sharing, uh, we'll, we'll be hearing the voices of John Finley, uh, Senior Policy Associate at CalCASA, and JDI Senior Program Officers Chris Mady and myself, Matthew Van Winkle. I use he, him pronouns. Hello, everyone. My name is John Finley, Senior Policy Associate with the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and I use he, him pronouns. Good morning, everyone. This is Chris, and I use they, them pronouns. Thank you both. Glad to be presenting with you today. So Just Attention International, or JDI for short, is a health and human rights organization that seeks to end sexual abuse in all forms of detention. It's JDI's belief that when the government takes away someone's freedom, it takes on an absolute responsibility to protect that person's safety. No matter what crime someone may have committed, rape is not part of the penalty. The California Coalition Against Sexual Assault is committed to ending sexual violence through a multifaceted approach of prevention, intervention, education, research, advocacy, and public policy. We provide leadership, vision, and resources to rape crisis centers, uh, individuals, and other entities committed to ending sexual violence. CalCASA envisions a world free from sexual assault and is committed to working around the country with many different organizations and change influencers to create this reality. The California Advancing PREA project, which is funded by the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, uh, allows CalCASA and JDI together to provide training and technical assistance to California rape crisis centers on how best to serve incarcerated survivors in their area. Uh, we also want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us from outside of California. Uh, we'll try to answer any and all questions you may have, and if we aren't able to answer the question during the webinar, we will definitely follow up with you uh, later. So today, we will be introducing you to Advocacy for All, an introduction to serving incarcerated survivors. This is a training developed for new advocates and volunteers at rape crisis centers. In order to help you provide this training, we've developed a facilitator's guide, which we will introduce today. We'll also be discussing special considerations and recommendations to ensure that the training you present best meets the needs of your advocates and the incarcerated survivors they will serve. There will be time for questions at the end of our presentation, but the chat box will be monitored throughout the webinar. So if something comes up as we're presenting at any time, please simply feel free to type it into the chat box. As always, we want to make sure you're taking care of yourself today um, in, every, in whatever way you're able to do that. For some, this can mean coloring, doodling, for others, simply standing and stretching. These can all be ways to take care of yourself during this pre presentation. So please, we encourage you to do that. Thank you, John, and hello, everyone. This is Chris. So we're going to start today by talking about the facilitator's guide that's been developed for you, Advocacy for All. We've received many requests for a training tool for advocates and volunteers who answer the hotline and accompany survivors to forensic exams. It's in response to this clear need that we've developed this two-hour PowerPoint training and corresponding facilitator's guide, which you in turn can present to your advocates and volunteers at your agency to best meet the needs of incarcerated survivors. If you look at the side panel for this webinar, you will see a handout section where you will see both the facilitator's guide and the corresponding PowerPoint slides. 
Everyone who's registered from this webinar will also be sent a follow-up email after this webinar ends so that they can download these documents. You will see that the facilitator's guide matches the slides and is divided into two columns with a row for each new slide. The left column has a picture of each slide in the presentation for easy reference. The right column has instructions on how to present the accompanying slide, including a sample script. Text in italics contains notes and directions for the trainer. Underlined text indicates places where you can insert the names of your agency and the facilities in your service area to help the training feel relevant and customized to your trainees. Text that's in brackets is considered bonus information that you can include when time permits and also to help guide discussions that may arise during the training. So let's talk through some of these slides. You will want to make sure that you can fit all of the content provided in the two hours allotted for this training. And you want to make sure that you are also keeping folks engaged as you go through the presentation. Starting a presentation can sometimes be a little bit tricky, but you want to start out by introducing the topic you'll be presenting on, which is providing emotional support services via the hotline and forensic accompaniment for survivors who are in detention. And of course, you also should introduce yourself. We didn't budget time into the two-hour training for around-the-room introductions because folks at your agency will likely already know each other or will have been in a volunteer training together for several hours already. It's definitely important for you to explain who you are, though, and also what your role is at the top of the training. Make sure you model best practice by sharing your pronouns as well as your name. Also provide your title, what you do, and how long you've been working with survivors who are incarcerated. The advocate training has four main content sections, plus time for questions. Although those joining us today have like participated in at least one California Advancing PREA training before, the training you provide for your advocates and volunteers may be the first time many of them encounter some of these ideas. The training begins by giving an overview of incarceration of, in the United States. This is followed by a section that delves more deeply into the problem of sexual abuse and detention, which in in, in, includes an introduction to understanding the dynamics of sexual abuse behind bars, data about the problem, what consent means in the context of detention, and quotes and survivors from quotes and stories from survivors. The training then introduces the Prison Rape Elimination Act, known as PREA, what it means for survivors, corrections facilities, and for advocates. Finally, we lay out the available services offered by victim advocates to incarcerated survivors and best practices advocates can use when working with a survivor who is incarcerated on the hotline and when providing accompaniment at a forensic exam. Just as we urged you to do at the beginning of this webinar, we include a self-care slide in the volunteer training. It's always a good idea to approach topics that may be triggering realistically and with the knowledge that it is natural for human beings to feel deep sadness, anger, and other emotions when hearing about abuse that has been done to others. Especially as there are videos of survivors speaking in this training, it will be important to let the participants know in advance that this is a heavy topic and that they should take care of themselves as they are able. Not only is self-care important for your participants to, pr to practice, but it's also important for you to practice as a trainer. As a trainer, you will have to be on during the training, so it's good to set time aside for yourself following the training, something to look forward to or something that will renew you. Given that folks in the community have a wide range of knowledge about what incarceration in the United States looks like, we wanted to provide some basics before jumping into the topic of sexual abuse behind bars. Things like the difference between jail and prison tend not to be common knowledge. When training on this section, it will be important to be mindful of your time. We recommend spending no more than 15 minutes on the seven slides in this section. Trainees may find the section very interesting and may have a lot of thoughts and questions. You'll have to find the balance between answering questions and addressing comments and staying on schedule. You will want to make sure that you don't run out of time for the upcoming sections of the training, which are more relevant to the hotline and forensic accompaniment work that your advocates and volunteers will be doing. To help this training feel like it's made for you and your agency, we have provided some space that you can customize the name or names of your CDCR prisons, as well as pictures if they are available. We encourage you to include specific data points, such as how many people are housed in the facility or facilities, and whether there are special considerations among the population there. 
Such information can help your advocates better understand the facilities and who is incarcerated there. When presenting this slide, it can be helpful for you to get a sense of if your advocates have been into the facility in your area and what their impressions are. You can do this by asking for a raise of hands and by asking about their impressions of this, what the facilities were. As you go forward on the section about detention in the United States, you may find that in talking about incarceration, there are biases against people who are in jail or prison. Explaining why many are in custody and dispelling myths that are sometimes perpetuated by local news reporting and television can help counter some of these biases. Presenting on the complex trauma histories of folks in detention can be helpful to create a whole picture for your participants. Understanding that there is a pipeline of trauma to prison helps to show the realities of who we lock up and why. The following section of the training deals with sexual abuse behind bars. Included in this section is the JDI produced video, My Name is Joe. Many of you have seen it. Joe's strength in telling his story is obvious, and so is the trauma that he still faces when remembering what was done to him. As always, we point out that the survivors are experts in their own experience. After playing this video to your participants, you can ask questions to promote discussion. You can start with simply asking for reactions or personal responses from the attendees. After providing space for anyone who would like to share, you can ask additional questions to highlight what we hope people take away from Joe's video, that what happened to him is unacceptable, and that the thing that helped him most following the assaults was Jessica simply recognizing his humanity. This video does focus on letter writing between Jessica and Joe. Be sure to let volunteers and other advocates know that while they will not be doing letter writing as Jessica did, everything Jessica shares about the way she provided support to Joe can be applied during forensic accompaniment and receiving hotline calls. The link to play this video is included in the facilitator guide, and you can also find the video on JDI's website as well as JDI's YouTube channel. We also wanted to create some space in the training for a point that can cause some confusion, particularly for people who have worked in corrections. When presenting this slide with the heading consent inside, you should anticipate some questions. It's fair to assume that everyone at your agency will know what consent is. While consent is possible between two people who are incarcerated, it is impossible for there to be consent between someone who is incarcerated and someone who is a staff member, contractor, or volunteer at the agency. All sexual activity between staff and inmates is abuse. Staff wield power over those who are incarcerated and there's no such thing as consensual sex between staff and an inmate. This is a crucial point to get across to those attending your training. We should note again that it is possible for two incarcerated people, fellow inmates, to engage in consensual sex. PREA was created to deal with abuse and harassment and does not deal with consensual sex between people who are incarcerated. That being said, again, consensual sex between inmates can be a violation of CDCR rules or prison rules and may result in discipline, although it is not a PREA violation. We've included several slides about the PREA standards in the PowerPoint, attempting to strike a balance between information that will help empower your advocates while not overwhelming them with information that they don't need to know in order to fulfill their role. After all, there are 52 PREA standards, and most of the standards have several subsections. We asked ourselves, what about PREA was most important for you to train your advocates on, and decided to limit this section to the most basic information on why PREA exists, what PREA requires facilities to do in terms of providing multiple means of reporting abuse, and what facilities must do to allow access to rape crisis services. The main takeaway for volunteers in understanding the PREA standards is knowing that there is a law out there that helps to provide people in detention from sexual abuse and helps advocates understand and explain a survivor's right when they are incarcerated. It will be important for advocates who will be answering the hotline to understand the multiple ways that someone can report sexual abuse or sexual harassment within the facility. As reporting from inside detention looks very different than it does in the community, and survivors may call the hotline with questions on how to report. Remember to tell your advocates that your agency is not a pre-reporting agency and that there are other ways that a person can report that advocates can help a survivor walk through. As always, when talking about reporting, highlight that reporting is always a survivor's choice and that the, as advocates, we are not there to pressure or tell someone how to report abuse or that they have to do it if that's not something that they want to do. 
The section of the training that has the largest amount of time budgeted deals with providing services to incarcerated survivors. This is where you will be able to provide tangible tools to your advocates on answering the hotline and going with a survivor to the hospital. You will want to give yourself about 45 minutes for this section. Be sure to add any agency-specific information where needed. It will be important to mention specifics such as where the forensic exams are done or if hotline calls come in on a different number. You also may get questions during this section on topics like mandated reporting. Where possible, integrate your agency's policies into this training. The providing services section of this training includes another JDI produced video highlighting Martine. Martine is a powerful speaker whose words help advocates understand how to meet survivors who are incarcerated where they are at. While Martine is not a survivor, he provides great insight into building trust. What he shares helps to frame the model we work under, the empowerment model, and highlights the need for good communication habits about your agency. For example, from the perspective of a survivor behind bars, they may be unaware that your agency is a totally separate entity from CDCR and that your advocates are not correction staff. Whenever meeting a new client, it's best practice to explain your, your agency and what they discuss with you will be kept confidential and not shared with CDCR staff. When talking to volunteers about the spectrum of your services your agency provides to survivors behind bars, be sure to explain that they as volunteers or advocates do versus what you as staff members or an advocate dedicated to the pre-work does. In most cases, your volunteers will be answering hotlines and providing forensic exam accompaniment, but we do want to be aware of the full ranges of, of services that your agency does offer. If your agency offers things like letter writing or in-person services within a facility, make sure your advocates understand how a survivor can get connected to those services and what those services look like so that they can explain that to a survivor on the hotline or at an exam. The total budgeted time for training is two hours and we recommend trying to complete the content portion in about an hour and 50 minutes to leave some time for questions. Depending on your presentation style, you can also encourage participants to ask questions as you go. This can often help participants feel more engaged. If you will be answering questions throughout the training, be sure to keep an eye on time and keep questions on track. You may need a parking lot for questions that can be answered after the training or one-on-one -on -one with the participant. Remember, even if you can't answer a question, you'll still want to hear it. What are people thinking about? What's coming up for them? The questions they ask can alert you to other topics you may need to provide follow-up information about. We recommend letting people know at the beginning of a training that you may not have the answer to every question immediately, but that you'll try to find the answer and follow up with them. Scenarios of hotline calls and forensic exams have been included at the end of the facilitator's guide. Scenarios can be a great tool for advocates to actually practice and apply skills they learn in trainings. Some agencies have particular days or times dedicated in their training schedule where advocates practice taking calls and working on scenarios. We encourage you to include these scenarios about working with incarcerated clients in all volunteer trainings, not only trainings that deal with folks who are incarcerated specifically. The goal is to avoid othering this population of clients based on where they live and to signal that the providing care to them is not extra or bonus work, but rather goes to our shared goal of ending sexual abuse for all people. Thank you very much, Chris, uh, for introducing the volunteer training and facilitator's guide. I just wanted to do a little uh, house cleaning with some questions we received um, that I uh, I want to just make sure that you all knew that you do have access to the PowerPoint. If you look in the interface for the webinar, you should see a handout section. Uh, you should be able to uh, click, download, open those files. If not, they will be included in our follow-up email following this, this presentation today. And today's recording uh, presentation is being recorded. Um, so you will be able to review it more uh, at a pace of your of your choosing. Um, and uh, yes, so that and Deborah, I will follow up with you uh, regarding the uh, the timing. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Chris, for introducing the volunteer training guide. Um, so we we tried to develop these tools so that anyone, regardless of their expertise level, 
can pick them up and present the training. Uh, but in addition to the, just these materials with the script, we want to present you with additional considerations and some recommendations to keep in mind as you plan your training, things that will help you achieve your training goals. So your agency is unique. All our agencies are unique, and your training should speak to that. So as a trainer, you have the power to set, to set yourself up for success. As you plan to provide the training to your agency, you, you're going to want to meet with your supervisor, members of your management team, to help discuss the importance of your advocates being trained on providing hotline and forensic exam accompaniment services specifically for folks who are incarcerated. You can invite leadership to introduce your training to help show that there's buy-in at your agency in serving this population. You can discuss with leadership who should be a part of the training and how to integrate the training so it's a regular part of the training that all advocates receive at your agency, making sure that your presentation is placed logically in the sequence of trainings for volunteers. For example, we, we wouldn't recommend this be the first training on the first day of your volunteer training, but a more, uh, more advanced, uh, more farther along placed. As you plan, you can also think about the materials and technology you'll need to have your presentation go as smoothly as possible. Uh, and while we realize agencies vary in staff size and capacity, it's recommended that you can identify uh, a supportive colleague who will help you on the day of the training. They can help you field questions, organize printed handouts, uh, assist with advancing slides and playing videos. It just tends to help things go a little more smoothly if not one person is responsible for the whole training. So who should be trained? We're recommending that all volunteers, advocates, and other staff who answer your rape crisis hotline or who might accompany survivors to forensic exams receive a training on serving incarcerated survivors. The facilitator's guide was developed to fit into the required Cal OES volunteer training hours, but it can also be used as continuing education for volunteers or as a staff training at your agency. To make sure that you've got a good foundation for your training, you and any co-presenters can visit the permanent online archive for the California Advancing PREA project uh, at the CalCASA website. This is a, a screenshot of it here. Um, it, it's at this page that you can view our new toolkit, Access for All, a guide to serving incarcerated survivors. And while that was written with a California lens uh, for advocates who will serve CDCR facilities, much of this toolkit is nationally relevant. Inside, you're going to find a lot of valuable information, such as information on who's most vulnerable in detention, checklists on how to build better relationships with PREA staff at your facilities, concrete steps you can take to incorporate survivors who are incarcerated into your larger work, as well as links to training materials, MOU templates, and other resources that can help you in this challenging work. And at this page, as you can see here, this is the archive webinars list, uh, you can you can access, access uh, these pre-recorded webinars, of which this will be one, uh, that, that talk about the basic services you offer to incarcerated survivors, such as letter writing, hotline calls, and forensic accompaniment, as well as many other topics that we've been able to address uh, since this project began. And we're aware that while many of you are experienced trainers, some have a little less experience and confidence presenting information to a group. So some, some simple rules to make sure you're engaged with your trainees are to not simply read from the script, uh, looking down at the paper, which causes folks to zone out a bit, not take what you're saying as seriously. You should establish early on in the training also that while you welcome raised hands for questions throughout the training, uh, you're going to provide a parking lot for questions you, you either don't have the answer to right away or are slightly off topic but still important, things that you just can't address in the moment. And as we've said and will continue to recommend, it really is best practice to work with a partner on the day of your training. You'll be glad to have the support of a colleague. Uh, who can figure out why the volume is too low on the laptop or write down questions in the parking lot or help you get handouts distributed. Um, 
it's always a great idea, I find, to have a clock in the room as well so that you can make sure you're on track and getting through the material in the allotted time. And during your training, you may be faced with questions you aren't expecting. That happens to us quite a lot. Uh, it can be useful to come back to the basics uh, if trainees are beginning to worry that they may not have the skills or the training needed to help survivors who are incarcerated. The basic job of an advocate is the same, regardless of whether the client is in custody or not. Advocates are to provide emotional support, information, advocacy, and referrals, to provide information on a survivor's rights, to maintain confidentiality, and to offer follow-up support. Another thing to spend some time preparing for is what might come up for folks when we're discussing the subject of providing services to survivors who are incarcerated. Rather than just hope for the best, it's good to be prepared for some of the common reactions, such as someone expressing concern about providing services to someone who may be a perpetrator themselves, or someone making a comment that supports the idea that someone in detention is dangerous. Fictionalized television depictions of detention and sensationalist news coverage play a role in perpetuating this, this sort of bias. A focus on crimes committed or perceived danger can unfortunately draw attention away from your training goals. We recommend you identify a few tools that can be used to redirect a conversation that goes off course. Obviously, one of the best tools you have is simply to remind folks that the training is about hotline calls, which don't require entrance to a facility, and forensic accompaniment, which would only very rarely require entrance to a facility, as the vast majority of prisons and jails do transport victims off-site to a hospital location to receive a forensic exam. Some receiving your training may also be prison abolitionists, people who are deeply committed to an end to incarceration. Uh, this is a topic that people have a wide range of opinions and questions about. And while very interesting, you should respectfully place this topic in the parking lot for later, discu later discussion. You can explain without agreeing or disagreeing that your interest today is on making sure that those serving folks in detention are trained to best support them and refer them back to the role of the advocate. Also, you may have folks in your training who are former correction staff or have family who are. Be sure not to minimize their safety concerns. Much of your ability to serve survivors in detention will rely on a level of professional respect with your local facility. And nowadays, it is more and more common for rape crisis centers to include language in job postings for new advocates, uh, language that makes it explicit that serving incarcerated survivors is gonna be part of their job. And more and more advocates at rape crisis centers have identified serving this historically underserved population as a personal priority in their own journey to ending sexual abuse. While our culture is slowly changing and advocates are stepping up in California and nationally to support all survivors, bias still exists for many people, some of whom are advocates. You may hear comments, jokes, or opinions you deeply disagree with during your training. Redirection to the basics is always encouraged, that no one deserves to be sexually assaulted, and that serving survivors is part of your agency's mission. The training is not the space for argument or for making someone feel that their experience doesn't matter, but you do want to always uh, make sure to counter with, with those basics. No one deserves to be sexually assaulted. We did not write the facilitator's guide um, with the expectation of participation from correction staff. Uh, and it's recommended that this training is, is presented by you and your colleagues only. Uh, while we want the relationship between your agency and your corrections facility to be strong, when it comes to volunteer training, there can be some drawbacks to making a co-presentation with the uh, with your corrections uh, facility colleagues and staff. We've observed a tendency in some, uh, by no means all, correction staff to place an outsized focus on the culture at their facilities as being one of danger, manipulation, et cetera. Uh, people are people, and if the fears and biases that may already exist are fed into by staff from a facility 
it can be very hard to reclaim the time you've allotted for other topics. For this reason, correction staff should not be included uh, as presenters until advocates already have a strong understanding of their role working with survivors behind bars. Once that understanding is there and you have time for ongoing education, then correction staff can be invited to talk to uh, your volunteers about what they do. But keep in mind applicability to your trainees. So if your hotline volunteers will not actually be entering the facility, then a presentation is not really the best use of their time. Uh, a presentation from, from correction staff, that is. If you do host a continuing education session with correction staff present, we recommend that the CDCR staff be involved in speaking with your volunteers only in cases where the relationship with those individuals is long-standing, built on trust, mutual respect for one another's role. You'll want to make sure you meet with them beforehand to go over what you want them to cover and to help them develop talking points that focus on their role, uh, not the advocate's role. Make sure they're staying kind of uh, to what they have expertise about. And definitely make sure that there's time budgeted for you to be able to debrief with your volunteers about the correctional staff presentation after afterwards, uh, in just uh, with only members of your agency present. That can be very helpful in clarifying your agency's role and position for your trainees, uh, as well as giving them a chance to ask questions and really uh, uh, so that so that you can uh, you can speak to to what what was said. At the end of the day, you and the call your colleagues at your agency are the experts when it comes to advocacy and providing support. CDCR is required by law to make your services accessible to survivors who are housed in their facilities. So. Wrapping up this section, here are some of the recommendations we've discussed to help you have a successful and focused training. Some of this is simply common sense. Uh, you'll want to make sure, as we said, that you're able to speak to your agency's policies and capacity uh, and to schedule this training appropriately in the larger context of volunteer trainings. So it's very important to involve your management team as you plan. Make sure that your training is a safe space for everyone, that no one is self-censoring out of fear of saying something wrong or making a mistake. Establish early on that this topic can bring up new questions and that everyone is allowed to speak and ask questions without fear of being judged. So prepare for what might come up and redirect back to the basics when necessary. And once again, it's more fun and makes for a smoother training when you work with a partner. We very much recommend that at the California Advancing PREA team. So we have time here for uh, a training scenario and you, if you have an answer or thoughts you can type them into the chat box. How would you redirect if this were to happen? During your volunteer training a new advocate raises their hand and says my dad worked at the prison and I heard stories you wouldn't believe. I'm not sure why we're sharing our hotline number in the prison. Aren't these perpetrators? How would you choose to redirect if you if you receive that? I think that one of the part of what's coming through in that statement is, uh, yep, mm -hmm. that's right. The offender has already been judged. The prison is the punishment, part of their judgment. Nobody deserves to be sexually assaulted, no matter their crime. That's right, Amy. Thank you. Coming uh, back, back to the basics. Thank you. Yep, discussing that all survivors have the right to services, and that people can be both offenders and victims. That's absolutely right. Yes, and I think what kind of the the subtext of this statement is there's a little bit of victim blaming happening here mm -hmm. although i'm sure there are stories we shouldn't compare the inmates to others we should treat them as individuals and the uh yeah it shouldn't be judged only by the worst thing that yet yeah, only by their crime that's absolutely right i'm hearing some great 
um, some great comments here. We need to be very wary of victim blaming statements that might come up. Uh, we don't want to feed into any pre-existing bias or fear. And yet at the same time, we do want to va validate what people, you know, people's lived experience. We don't want to get into an argument or a debate, but we just want to come back to basics, uh, why our agencies exist and what we actually have the capacity to offer and what, we, what we're going to do for, for survivors, no matter where they're housed. The truth is that no one person is just one thing. Yeah. Yep. Certainly, yeah. Talking about the trauma that many uh, who are incarcerated have experienced beginning at a very early age. Yeah, these are great thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So, and I saw a comment above someone that said they were gaining in confidence. Uh, we're very glad to hear that. We know that you can do it. It's, uh, this is something that you can do. It's not so, uh, it's not so outside of your already developed skills. Um, and with preparation and care, you really can provide a training uh, that's gonna better enable your volunteers to provide services. The flow of knowledge in this work is the flow of, of healing. So by sharing what you've learned with others, you're touching the lives of the survivors that those you, you train will go on to help. And finally, you can feel confident in your training because incarcerated survivors need the skills you already have. Uh, just as Jessica in the My Name is Joe video was able to trans transfer her skills that she developed working with survivors in the community to Joe simply by recognizing his humanity and his right to not be victimized, um, seeing him as a person, um, these are skills you already have and you're already providing hotline support and forensic exam and accompaniment. This is, uh, these are the basic uh, building blocks of making sure that, that survivors who are in detention are receiving a, more or less a, a community level of care. And at the end of the day, your agency's mission is striving to make sexual abuse a thing of the past, period. This is all a very important part of that work. And we wanna make, uh, make you all aware of some upcoming trainings. Um, and thank you all uh, to everyone who's joined us today. Um, we are on November 7th, we're gonna be hosting an in-person all day training in Sacramento that we hope to see you at. Uh, and on November 19th, we'll be hosting another webinar which will focus on serving survivors in local county jails. And you'll make sure to look for emails regarding these trainings uh, and how you can attend. And thank you, Matthew. And as a brief reminder to those who are joining us from California that, lo that work with their local CDCR facilities, we need to report on the services we're providing. So we really count on you all to submit those monthly advancing PREA progress reports, which are due on the 10th of each month. So tracking these services at your agencies help provide survivors those services um, and reporting them to us helps us secure that funding and show the impact of the work that you're doing. So please make sure you're sending in those reports. Again, they're due on the 10th of the end of, uh, of each month. Again, we'd also like to remind you about our toolkit, which can help provide a basis for advocates new to working with survivors behind bars. Another new resource that you'll see coming up is CalCASA Support for Survivors Manual. Um, and John, would you like to say a little bit more about this? Sure. So we were just approved by the by Cal OES, the Governor's Office of Emergency Services, um, to release a newly updated support for survivors manual. Um, CalCASA will be sending one of these to each California Rape Crisis Center as a resource. Um, it touches on things like survivor rights, on um, training for advocates. It really provides a great overview of how best to provide the services to survivors of sexual assault in California. Um, folks who are on the call nationally who are not in California, um, you may want to reach out to your state sexual assault coalition or sexual assault domestic violence coalition um, to see if they already have a support for survivors guide like this. Many around the country have also been doing this. So it's a, it's a really fantastic resource that we're excited to release to rape crisis centers in California. Thank you. And similar resources and other helpful information can also be found on JDI's and CalCASA's websites, as well as the PREA Resource Center website, which we encourage you to check out. 
That being said, as always, please never hesitate to reach out to us directly. So you can reach us at either advocate at justattention.org or priya at calcasa.org. And so this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to the CalCASA website soon. Guests today will receive an email with a copy of the PowerPoint, as well as that facilitator's guide that we spoke about and the slides that we introduced today. Although you can also find those in the handout section of this webinar that we're presenting today. We would love to hear your feedback on this training and a link to the evaluation for this training has been shared into the chat box and will be shared also in our follow-up email. Um, we'd really be grateful if you took the time um, to complete the short survey and just let us know how we can improve and what we did right. So thank you. And I know Matthew is putting that in the in the I chat am. box for you all now. I am. So we do have some time for questions. Um, so please type any questions you might have into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, and you know, take a look at that facilitator's guide if there's particular slides that you or a script that you're a little bit confused on or you think advocates might get tripped on, tripped up on that we didn't go over, please, now's a great time to ask those questions so we can really help you understand it and so that you can give the best training that you can. I see a question here. What if when someone comes in to do a forensic exam, but you are not allowed to be with alone with them because an officer says they can't be alone with you? How do you get to have your confidential one-on-one -on -one time with them? Um, I think that's a great question, and I think there's not there's not really one answer. I think that you can you although in those situations the officer tends to be uh, in control of the situation, what the um, what the survivor is, you know, how the survivor is being monitored, and that's part of their job. I think that you can always advocate for someone even just to step a few feet back, or if there are two officers in the room, ask for one of them to leave. Um, and then lower your voice, uh, as simple as that might sound, I think sometimes there just is no better uh, option to kind of get, get as close as you feel getting, uh, as close as you feel comfortable getting and making sure that you're there, to, they know that you're there to support them. Um, there's no perfect solution uh, to your question. We do have a, a webinar that deals with this topic specifically, um, accompanying incarcerated survivors at forensic exams that is on CalCASA's website. Uh, we, we have really been grateful for the time you've shared with us here today. Uh, we're grateful for your commitment to serving all survivors. Um, and thank you very much. I think we'll, uh, I think we'll close the webinar. Thank you all and have a good day.